Hello again, and welcome to AI Images. This week, we're talking about the data sets once again, this time looking at artists who are in the data set and how to think about moving from what these images are to what these images do. And we're going to think about that in a little bit more detail. Often when we talk about AI art that is made by combining the names of artists, we hear the phrase, good artists borrow, great artists steal, which is attributed to either Steve Jobs or Salvador Dali or William Faulkner or Igor Stravinsky, depending on where you find it on the internet. The actual quote seems to come from T.S. Eliot, the poet who in 1920 wrote a book called The Sacred Wood, Essays on Poetry and Criticism. And this is what he actually said. One of the surest tests is the way in which a poet borrows. Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal, bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better, or at least something different. The good poet welds his theft into a whole of feeling which is unique, utterly different from that from which it was torn. The bad poet throws it into something which has no cohesion. A good poet will usually borrow from authors remote in time or alien in language or diverse in interest. Critics of AI art write that the images are cheap knockoffs of great works. The art critic Jerry Stahls said in an interview that most AI art was crapola illustration and indicated that most of the work he'd seen has been done hundreds of millions of times by humans in history. Stahls didn't talk about data sets. But data sets do offer one explanation for this. If you're drawing on the images in the data set to make art, you are drawing on statistical averages of millions of pieces of art. This includes historical paintings, illustrations, comic books, video game screen grabs, dental records, nature drawings, charts and diagrams, selfies, the list goes on. The entire range of images are in these data sets, but they are all things that have been done. In order to make something profoundly new with these images, you would need to be profoundly creative with how you use them. This is a question I find really interesting, not just for AI images, but art making in general. If you want to make something new, how do you make it with something that contains everything that has already been done? If you want to change the way people see the world, how do you do that with a data set of everything they've already seen? In our last class, we took a look under the hood of the data sets that drive many diffusion models, uncovering some of the problematic ways that the data has categorized people. This week, we're continuing to look at the data sets from a different angle. We'll look at what the data set is with regard to artists, but we'll also look at what you can do with these data sets. What are the limits on what you can make? What are the ethics around making generated images? And what are the effects that these images might have? We'll look at the relationship between the images we get from stable diffusion and mid-journey and the ways they reflect and don't reflect the images made by living artists. We'll ask a broader question about art and power, looking at a history of artists who deliberately used appropriation to make their work. What defines an artist who appropriates as a form of art and commentary from an artist who copies or plagiarizes work? To begin with, it's important to note that there are a lot of ways to address the question of artists in these data sets. First, there's the legal question. A number of lawsuits are being filed against various AI image generation tools for a number of reasons. One of these is a class action lawsuit on behalf of artists whose work was included in the training data without their permission, arguing that because people can generate AI artworks based on their styles without their consent, they're owned financial damages. Or at least, companies profiting on these technologies need to stop using those images. Another is the photography company Getty Images, which is suing Stability AI, the company that runs Stable Diffusion, for using its images without permission. Use of copyright material without permission is eligible for a fine of up to $150,000 per offense. And Getty believes Stability AI used 12 million of its images 
If you don't want to do the math, they are filing a $1.8 trillion lawsuit just under the total value of every service and product sold in the United States in a single year. The class action lawsuit is about the use of artist expression in the data set, the styles, color choices, and other aspects of art that make up artistic expression. The Getty lawsuit is about copyright, the protection of specific works of art, and the right to choose who makes copies and derivative works from things like photographs or movies. Getty is saying that by looking at the images, breaking them down, and creating models based on the patterns within them, Stability AI has made a derivative work. It's not necessarily that we go in and prompt something and get an image that is owned by Getty. Getty is arguing that the act of making these images into data is a derivative work. In other words, the model that runs Stable Diffusion is in and of itself created from derivative work, even if nobody ever used it. It's important to note that there are very different legal arguments and justifications for these lawsuits, and that they draw on a different set of precedents. We will go over some aspects of the law in a later class, but today we want to look at the data as it relates to artists and artistic expression. We want to dig into the data sets and see what we find and what we think. So that was the legal frame for the question. There's also the ethical frame. This is the question that surrounds data sets of any kind, and that's the idea of consent. Who gets to decide what data is in the data set? If an artist uploads an image to DeviantArt with the intent of sharing it with humans, does that imply that they are sharing that image with deep learning systems too? In reality, they clearly were. Maybe you believe that there's no difference between a robot or a person looking at and being inspired by a work of art that you make. But do you think that artists should be able to decide what happens to their own work on their own terms? These are the ethical questions around participation and informed consent. Do people know what they are agreeing to when they share data? Are people expected to anticipate every possible use of the pictures they post online? And how much control do they have over that data once they share it? Should artists be able to remove these images from those data sets? We're going to talk about artists in the data set, but I also want to talk about artists who are making work about data sets. One of these artists is Heather Dewey Hagborg, whose work is designed to raise questions about data privacy. Note that when we upload information to social media networks or use facial recognition to activate an app, we may not care very much about what happens to our information. Likewise, we may say, if an artist shares their work on a public website, well, they should know that just about anything can happen to that data. Heather Dewey Haberg's piece, Stranger Visions, takes that logic away from the digital world and into our physical world. What if any stray piece of data we left behind in the real world could be obtained by anyone to do anything they want? Let's take a look.
So this work reminds me of how hard it can be to anticipate potential uses of our information. This work is about a lot of things, and if it makes you uncomfortable, well, of course it does. One of the things this piece raises for me is the question of consent. You don't consent to having your face 3D printed onto a mask when you leave a straw in a cup at the coffee shop, or when a strand of hair is left behind on the bus. But it's possible that will happen. And part of this work is about saying that this is possible, and commenting on the state of DNA technology and such extractive technologies. But it's also, to me, about what are we supposed to expect about the ways that our data gets used. Artists may upload work for the public to look at. It may be a way of getting noticed, or finding commissions, or finding a community. I'm willing to bet that at no point did any artist in the last 10 years expect that putting their work online would result in it being used to train a massive artificial intelligence system that could create artworks. It would be unimaginable. Very much like a mask of your face being made from a discarded cigarette would be unimaginable. And yet, now, the concern is that the images in these datasets are contributing to art that looks like their illustrations, which means that more art in their style is being generated without their permission, without their knowledge, and certainly without any compensation, which brings down the value of their artwork. Arguably, this is true even if users prompt the model without using a specific artist's name. We can use Magritte for an example. Magritte famously painted this image titled The Treachery of Images. It's a painting of a pipe with the words beneath it, roughly, this is not a pipe. We can look at the data set and see that this pipe is pretty well associated with Magritte, even more so if you just say Magritte pipe. And yet, if we look for pipes themselves, indeed, these are not pipes, but Magritte's pipe is actually the only pipe of this sort in the first results. Now, the first page of results is scratching the surface of the image data. It's not meant to be complete. We look at the first page of these results just to get a rough idea of what is in there. And the point I'm trying to make is that an artist's name is strongly correlated to that artist's style, but it may also sometimes be parts of other categories. So here we see that Magritte's style is actually the only pipe in the first page of pipe search results on Layon. So let's see what happens if we prompt Magritte pipe in stable diffusion. What we get are images in the style of Magritte, but we don't actually see that many pipes, maybe some pipe-like things. So the style associated with Magritte is actually very strong. Magritte's name is associated with many images with a particular style of painting, one that probably overwhelms any particular image of a pipe. So the model has a strong inclination towards rendering stuff from the Magritte side of its space, more so than the pipe category here, because it has so much more information, common information about what these images would look like based on Magritte alone. It's trying to trace an image back from pure noise that matches the caption Magritte pipe, right? Magritte says pretty clearly it's going to look like whatever Magritte paints, because that's what's in the data set, and that's strong in its clarity of style. Magritte has a specific style. That style is often described with Magritte's name in images online. That gets absorbed into Leon. Those patterns get sort of deconstructed, and now when you write Magritte, you get the style that Magritte paints in whereas pipe images are all over the place. There are many, many pipe images. There are different types of objects that are referred to by the word pipe. There's the pipe you smoke, there is the pipe that runs into your shower. So it's not as strong a signal to follow. Meanwhile, if we do paintings of a pipe with no particular artist, we get paintings of plumbing. Just for fun, we can also ask for renderings for the phrase, this painting is not a pipe, or the original French. And then we're literally asking the model to give us something that is not a pipe. Ironically, it still gives us paintings of pipes. 
Do you have a theory about why, based on what we just described? So you can pause it if you want to think about this. But basically, diffusion doesn't understand the meaning of language. It only understands the keywords and phrases. It sees that you have the word painting, and it sees that you have the word pipe. And so those are the words with clear representations in the data set. Not, not, quote, not, or, quote, a, right? So this painting is not a pipe. The words that have real meanings and associations with them are painting and pipe. So these models work by finding information associated with your prompt, not based on any kind of thinking about what you are trying to say. It does not understand the context. If keywords are often lumped together, that pair of words might form its own category. But when trying to render an image from a prompt, the model is going to go with whatever has the greatest representation in the data set. And this is why knowing what's in the data set for the images you want to make can be helpful in steering the data set towards the things you want. We'll talk more about that when we talk about prompts later in the semester. For now, the key thing to know is that when artists are in the data set and in your prompt, you will get images in their style. That may be obvious. Their name is associated with so many of their images that it becomes associated with the features of their artwork. Now, if you're an illustrator who posts a webcomic, for example, you may end up represented in this data set even more than Picasso. And if your images are constantly being described as your name plus webcomic, then the other thing that will happen is your name will start to be associated with webcomics more generally. So your style will become part of the category of images related to webcomics. In essence, your name is one path to those images and styles but your work is entangled with lots and lots of images from the same genre. That's what happened to Greg Rutkowski, a fantasy art illustrator whose work was used as a default prompt for an early diffusion model called Disco Diffusion. Rutkowski's name was associated with so many images as a result of this that his own art became buried under AI-generated copies. So imagine you're going to Disco Diffusion, this early diffusion model, and it's saying, try out uh, this prompt. And that prompt is literally Greg Rutkowski's name. Everyone who makes that image, who then shares that image with the copy of the prompt, has now shared that image on social media or the internet with his name. This wasn't necessarily an issue of the images copying his style, though that was the case. It's that his name became synonymous with AI-generated fantasy art. So if you googled his name, you would see all these AI-generated artworks instead of his actual work. Now, as a working artist, that is a bad situation, especially because the art that was being put up may not have been the caliber or quality that... Greg Rukowski wanted associated with his name. So as a result of this, Stability AI removed his images from the data set, and in December of 2022, they introduced a method for individual artists to remove their work from the training data. One of the big questions around AI art is whether you should be able to use artist names in the prompts. On the one hand, some say that combining elements of artist styles is how culture works. We see things, we blend things, we draw inspiration from art and make our own, with new evolutions and mutations emerging from the translation. It's important to think about the quote we started this class with, that good artists borrow and great artists steal, and compare it to what the actual quote says. Again, Bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better, or at least something different. So what is the difference between defacing someone's art? What might it mean to make it different? The answer is going to vary from person to person, but as a class that is thinking critically about these issues, we want to think about this question as a question of power. Because good and bad art is in the eye of the beholder. What is tacky and cheap to one person may be beautiful and moving to another. We mentioned the art critic Jerry Stoltz at the start of this class, and there are other critics who have weighed in as well. Mike Peppy writes, 
I guess I'm just very frustrated with these tech people coming in and willy-nilly trying to use these interesting GAN networks to spit out something that just sort of looks like surrealist or abstract, he says. I definitely feel like there are some artists who do that, and the results just aren't very good. Now, this is not an art criticism class. It's not a class about deciding what's good and bad. It's a critical thinking class. So instead of thinking in terms of good or bad, let's think about the ways that image synthesizing tools can create power and take power away when you use them in this way. As an example, we can go back to an interesting early history of generative synthesis, the invention of the RCA Corporation's Mark I synthesizer a three-ton mashup of digital data devices, mechanical and electromagnetic transduction circuits, tuning forks and vacuum tubes, punched paper rolls, wire brushes, relays, resonator chains, amplifiers, speakers, and disc recorders. Invented by Milton Babbitt. In another field, music can now be produced entirely by electronics. No known instruments are involved. Coded information is punched out. An electronic music synthesizer does the rest. This is music with a strictly electronic beat. Describing the process of testing this equipment, one of the designers writes, We analyzed piano recordings of Polonaise by Chopin and Claire de Lune by Debussy, played by Iturbi, Rubinstein, and Horowitz. Also the old refrain by Chrysler, played by Chrysler. The analysis was then synthesized and recorded, and we intermixed short excerpts of the synthesized and original recordings for a test. We had 14 excerpts. Seven original and seven synthesized. Professional musicians and laymen were unable to detect the original from the synthesized versions. This proved that the electronic music synthesizer could produce great music. In a 1961 essay, Babbitt, the inventor of the Mark I, wrote, Present day electronic media for the total production of sound, providing precise measurability and specificity of frequency, intensity, spectrum, envelope, duration, and mode of succession, remove completely those musical limits imposed by the physical limitations of the performer and conventional musical instruments. The region of limitation is now located entirely in the human perceptual and conceptual apparatus and the discovery and formulation of these constraints fall in the province of the psychoacoustician. This kind of rhetoric probably seems familiar, as it's describing the movement of art making by moving away from musicians and moving into the hands of machines, and saying that to do it, to make this art more perfectly with greater freedom and flexibility, the machine is unconstrained by the burden of mastering a skill or craft. No missing notes. No running out of breath. It was also tested, not trained, but tested on a variety of existing musical pieces to see how it would perform. Later, the synthesizer would be leaned on to produce new sounds and new styles of composition that didn't sound like existing music. But at the start, it was designed to replicate what was already out there. We should think about this when we think about image synthesizers like Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion. Right now, much of what people make is replication. They can find an artist's name and make something like that artist. And the effect is likely to be similar to that of the musical synthesizer. This music didn't sweep the charts, and eventually people became interested in what you could do with it. Here's Henry Poussure, Scamby from 1957, an attempt to make something that sounded like a synthesizer instead of sounding like a computer playing a piano or a banjo.
So, okay, that may not be your cup of tea, and that's fine. But this experimentation is what led us to a new path for music. Away from the RCA Mark I and its reproduction of classical music and pianos and existing sounds, and into an era where electronic sounds could create new genres. Another experimental musician, Delia Darbyshire, was also intrigued by the potential of electronic sounds. Here's a track made in 1963. And while it sounds a little bit different, sounds a little bit more of its time, note the similarities to things like house music, IDM, and techno. Uh, forget about this. This is for interest only. Okay, coming up. So there are two ways of looking at the music synthesizer. On the one hand, it was designed in a way that was an explicit threat to music makers of the time. Music performers would be replaced by this perfect machine that never ran out of breath, that never missed a note. On the other hand, some musicians were able to take it and experiment and try to make something new with it. The difference there was a matter of power. What was the power they had over this machine? If you look at the technology as a way of copying and replacing humans, it can be read as a tool of power against artists. If you look at the technology as a way of making something that hasn't been heard before, it can be thought of as a way of creating new forms of power, power of expression, creativity, and ideas. But a key point to make is that these things are not mutually exclusive. They are both happening at the same time. And so it's important to think about the potential of new technologies as well as their consequences. With images, people have often thought about and engaged with the question of appropriation. Is AI art appropriation? Well, let's start thinking about what appropriation is. We can look a bit to the way artists have tackled this when confronted by photography. From the 1960s to the 1980s, artists began to consciously appropriate photographic images. They did it by shifting the way they thought about images, not just as representations, per se, but as concepts. Images stopped being about what the images showed us and started being about images as ideas. There's an argument that our culture is overflowing with images and that it's only natural to approach images as the source material for making new images. Some artists put forward the idea that images are part of our landscape. They ask why images need to be original in the first place. We talked about collage when we talked about GANs. GANs had a crucial technological distinction from diffusion. They were constrained to what was put into a specific archive by what was isolated and pulled apart from the overall sea of images. Diffusion isn't built on isolated archives. Diffusion is based on billions of uncategorized images and their captions. Last year, Cosmopolitan put out its first AI-generated cover, which you see here. And it's worth saying, if you ask for a photograph of an astronaut, you aren't necessarily getting a particular individual's photograph of an astronaut. You're getting the model's idea of what an astronaut is, based on the patterns of pixels that are common to images labeled astronaut. So this is everybody's astronaut. This image was then retouched and remixed, reshaped to fit the size of the magazine, and composited with other sort of background effects and things like that. So it's not pure out of the generator. And you can see that there's a helmet as a way to get around what at the time was actually a restriction on human faces and occasionally uh, challenging to get good human faces, but at the time, Dolly 2 actually wouldn't put out faces as a security mechanism. 
Thinking about the image of an astronaut in this way changes the meaning of the astronaut image. It's not a photo shoot where a single photographer is directing the image making process. It isn't anybody's expression of something unique about a specific astronaut. It blends together images of people who are critical of astronauts and people who love astronauts. It gives you, in a sense, the absolute average of all astronauts. We can also look at this piece, Hot Shot by Robert Rosenberg from 1983. Rosenberg is taking other images whole and putting them into a new arrangement, suggesting a new work. Pretty much nothing that Rosenberg has assembled here is keeping its original meaning. But he hasn't done anything to these images except put them into a new context by putting them together where they haven't been associated with each other before. He's using these images to tell a new story, to steer the viewer into some new way of making sense of these images. So even though this is literally a series of other people's photographs, the arrangement and their selection can be said to tell a new story. We might also look at it with some curiosity. What made Rauschenberg pick these images? We can ask that about this piece in a way that we can't ask stable diffusion. In a few weeks, we'll talk more about prompts, but I'm showing you this work to raise a question. Is the artist who writes a prompt doing the work that Rauschenberg did in selecting these images? Is there a difference between pulling images, pulling pictures from an archive to tell a new story, and pulling pixel arrangement data out of an image model to tell a new story? There's a lot of debate about that. And as I told you at the start of the semester, I don't have a comfortable conclusion myself. So I pose this question to you to consider and think about. In all of these discussions, what we're really talking about is called appropriation. Appropriation is the use of another artist's style as a way of commenting on that style, or just doing something new with that style. You can appropriate an artist as an homage or as a critique. You can appropriate an image as outright theft. Remember what T.S. Eliot said about this kind of theft. Not that great artists steal, but that the good poet welds his theft into a hole of feeling, which is unique, utterly different from that from which it was torn. The bad poet throws it into something that has no cohesion. So the good poet welds his theft into a whole unique way of seeing, of feeling, of experiencing something. And that is different from the source, from the source of that image. The bad poet, on the other hand, takes, steals, and throws it into something that doesn't make any sense, doesn't have any cohesion. Let's think about cultural appropriation as well. There's a difference between appropriation as we're talking about it and cultural appropriation. So to be clear, to differentiate cultural appropriation from general cultural exchange, scholars refer to power dynamics. This lawyer, Susan Scafidi, defines appropriation as, quote, taking intellectual property, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or artifacts from someone else's culture without permission. We can contrast appropriation with cultural appropriation. There is different elements to this when we're talking about cultural appropriation. And power dynamics is common across both of these. Appropriation in art has been around for a while. Duchamp, the pioneer of Dada, famously drew a mustache on a copy of the Mona Lisa. But the appropriation artists arrived at a, as a movement in the early 1980s. In an essay for the Met, Douglas Eklund writes, What these fledgling artists had fully to themselves was the sea of images into which they were born. The media culture of movies and television, popular music, and magazines that to them constituted a sort of fifth element, or a prevailing kind of weather. Their relationship to such material was productively schizophrenic. While they were first and foremost consumers, they also learned to adopt a cool, critical attitude toward the very same mechanisms of seduction and desire that played upon them from the highly influential writings of French philosophers and cultural critics such as Michel Foucault, Roland Barthes, and Julia Kristeva that were just beginning to be made available in translation. Among these thinkers' central ideas was that identity was not organic and innate, 
but manufactured and learned through highly refined social constructions of gender, race, sexuality, and citizenship. These constructions were embedded within society's institutions and achieved their effects through the myriad expressions of the mass media. Barthes infamously extended this concept to the question of the very possibility of originality and authenticity in his 1967 manifesto, The Death of the Author, in which he stated that any text or image, rather than emitting a fixed meaning from a singular voice, was part of a tissue of quotations that were themselves references to yet other texts, and so on. So this is where this idea of the appropriation of images came from. Images were freed from the author's intent, and they took on a life of their own. As consumers of images, we are shaped by these images, as the thinking here goes. But we also shape the ways that these images are interpreted. We negotiate our relationship with images. Uh, as images come into a, our life, our field of vision, we can tell ourselves our own stories about those images. And we can also use those images, take those images, and put them forward in our own stories. If images seek to assert control, which is what this quote here says, then artists, it argues, can assert counter-narratives and produce new types of culture that reverse that power dynamic. So images can sort of subvert power, play with power. As the messages come in, we can take those messages and we can use those messages to craft new messages. One of the artists of this generation is the photographer Shari Levine, who took this iconic photo. But it's not the iconic photo you might think it is if you've seen it before. On the left is Shari Levine's photograph of the photo on the right, which was taken by Walker Evans. Shari Levine photographed the photograph and presented it with an open and explicit acknowledgement, calling the work after Walker Evans. This is a way of posing a question about photography and images now that we live in a sea of them. Levine explained the work this way. Originality was always something I was thinking about, but there's also the idea of ownership and property. It's not that I'm trying to deny that people own things. That isn't even the point. The point is that people want to own things, which is more interesting to me. What does it mean to own something? And stranger still, what does it mean to own an image? A key distinction here may depend on how you interpret this work. On the one hand, Levine has said that taking Evans's work and placing it in a new context creates a new work because it starts a new conversation. It raises new sets of questions and it creates a new relationship between the viewer and the image than the one that was originally intended by Walker Evans. Thus the title, after Walker Evans, as in Evans had his time with this story, now it's time for someone else. You can also look at this as a feminist critique of power structures, an intervention by a female photographer in the white male-dominated space of the 1980s New York art world and beyond. To quote T.S. Eliot, one form of defacement examined from the lens of power can be to take someone's artwork and make it something else. That is an act of power. When we are talking about data and images, and let's be clear that I'm speaking only on the use of data and images, appropriation can change meanings when you consider who is the one taking and who is being taken from. Levine wasn't stealing Walker Evans's work in ways that would impact Walker Evans, who was long dead. But even if she had, what was the balance of power between Evans, a famous photographer for decades by the time Levine had done this, and Levine, who had more power? And how did Levine shift that power? And does that matter? Today you might think, well, okay, I can appropriate Walker Evans too by asking Midjourney to create a Walker Evans style portrait. And we might think of diffusion models as appropriation machines, systems that look at the same sea of images that we do and impose their own logic on them. If you take Sherry Levine's perspective, that appropriation can be a way of reclaiming power, but that opens up a pretty big question. That's the question of where power lies in these systems. Who do we want to respect when we use them? Midjourney, Dolly 2, and Stable Diffusion are learning from our data 
my data, your data, the data of artists and photographers, and they're building tools that people pay for to make new things. Is a diffusion model in a position to take power from human image makers? Perhaps. If there's a sea of cheap images made in someone else's style without their permission or their consent, it would seem to be the case that those images would lead to people being bored by it. If I have a style that's very unique to me and the only place to get images of that style are from me, then I have a lot of power over my own work. But if suddenly anyone in their uh, basement or bedroom can generate two dozen images in my style, then that changes the kind of power that I have over my own creativity and thoughtfulness. That would be like using a synthesizer to replace a performer. But on the other hand, is there something that we as users of the tools could do to change the balance of power with the machines and the companies that build them and train them on our data? Can we use them to make something new and different that doesn't look like anything else? In that case, it's like using the synthesizer to invent a new style of music altogether. And these are pretty interesting questions, and they don't always have clear answers. Combining the names of different artists may lead to a fusion of styles that seems interesting and unique, as in a collage. Using a single artist's name in a way to create a commentary about that artist or put them in a new conceptual framework the way that Cherry Levine did might be another interesting strategy. In that case, Levine looked to photographers who already had a great deal of power rather than obscure illustrators who were trying to eke out a living uh, sharing their work on DeviantArt and ArtStation. So you might think it really doesn't matter that ultimately you wanna use these tools to make cool stuff, but it's worth thinking about where the tool comes from, who benefits from it and who loses out. As Douglas Cripp explained in his essay about the exhibition of appropriation artists, which was called Pictures, we are not in search of sources or origins, but of structures of signification. Underneath each picture, there is always another picture. And so this would be the question is, if underneath every picture there is another picture, are you just making another picture? Or are you thinking about structures of signification? In other words, are you trying to say something new with the image that you're making from these other pictures? That's the key question, I think, when we think about the question of power and notability and making something, quote unquote, new. Let's look at another example. One of the artists who responded to the images around them was Andy Warhol. Warhol famously painted images he saw in the world, including Coca-Cola bottles and Campbell's soup cans. These were just images in the supermarket. These were not the iconic photo that Warhol has made them. These are just products that Warhol saw and painted and arguably changed the meaning of Coca-Cola labels and Campbell soup can labels. Warhol wrote, as for the paintings, the images I've used have all been seen before via the media. I guess they're media images always from reportage photographs or from old books or from four for a quarter photo machines. No, I don't change the media, nor do I distinguish between my art and the media. I just repeat the media by utilizing the media for my work. I believe media is art. So Warhol had a particular position, a particular way of making art, a particular statement that he was making with his art. This changed the way that we encountered these labels of soup cans and Coca-Cola bottles and laundry detergent boxes. And there's an interesting timeline to think about all of these layers and how they come together. In 1964, Patricia Caulfield publishes this photograph of hibiscus blossoms in an issue of Modern Photography magazine. Andy Warhol picked up a copy of this magazine, saw the image, and cut it out. He blew up the photo and he used an industrial process, silk screening, to make a kind of stamp to simplify it a bit so he can create as many copies of this image as he wants. He would paint underneath them or over them in a variety of colors and then he would start to sell them. 
flowers. It's made from Caulfield's work, and Caulfield sues Warhol over image rights. Now, eventually, they settled out of court. The agreement was that Caulfield would get one of Warhol's paintings, and uh, amusingly, so would her lawyer. Um, but I want to suggest that the legal definition of diffusion models is still an open question. When you create artworks using an artist's name in the prompt, it's very clear that you are asking the machine to produce a derivative work. If you get an image of a cartoon character that looks like an existing cartoon, it's a derivative work. That's true whether an AI makes it or if you draw it yourself. So the legal questions of using work that looks like someone else's work is still open because it's new, but that doesn't mean these questions are particularly different or difficult. They just haven't been tested yet. And there are many more complex questions at play. We can think about these as questions of legal authority in terms of who owns what image, to use Sherry Levine's words, but we can also think about them in terms of agency what you do with what the machine gives you, and what the machine does with what we share. This class, as I have said before, is oriented around the idea that these outputs are products for you to use, rather than ends in and of themselves, and that by using them thoughtfully, with attention to your responsibilities to other people, well, that's probably the best course of action. The fact of the matter is, when you're taking an AI-generated image, you're taking an image produced by a machine using a specific process, one that abstracts millions of images into the constraints you give it. The AI is not an artist. It isn't filtering the world through any kind of experience, any sense of curiosity or wonder or joy, any kind of memory or culture. It has no stories to tell. But you are an artist. You are a storyteller because you are human. And when you work with these images or tools, the most important question is not whether or not you made it, but what you do with it to tell a story that tells your story, or raises your questions, or challenges what you want to challenge. Warhol was an artist making new artwork out of an existing artwork. It's been radically transformed, and in the end, the legal side of the question remains open. But here's another wrinkle. In 1990, an artist named... Elaine Sturtevant created a series of her own called Repetitions. Repetitions took Warhol's original screen prints, that stamp that he actually used to make the original flowers paintings, and then she used that to make more of them, which was a series that she called Warhol's Flowers. Sturtevant didn't invent the image herself, it's an appropriation of Warhol's appropriation. She didn't make the image herself because the screen print was already made. Instead, Sturtevant simply took Warhol's existing process and then did it on her own. Now, at this point, we might say, enough's enough. One copy is art, two copies is theft. But like Sherry Levine, I would suggest that the question of originality is separate from the question of what's interesting. Because Sturtevant had a logic to this image that was completely distinct from Warhol's and completely distinct from Caulfield's. Sturtevant was raising a question. Why was Warhol's work a Warhol in the first place? Many of Warhol's images were made by studio assistants, and the process was mechanical. It was so mechanical that she could take the machine and make it on her own. And Warhol wasn't the only artist who worked this way. You could go back to Rodin and Camille Claudel, the studio apprentice who sculpted many of Rodin's works. So Sturtevant is using this work to comment on the artwork and the process of making the artwork, the question of originality that surrounds the art world, the, in a way the myth of the artist, of the idea of the artist as the person who made the thing. There are many people involved in the making of things, just as there are with software or code. A work of art is oftentimes not even made by the artist whose name is on the work. So Sturtevant is raising this question, putting this image into the conversation, starting her own conversation, and I leave it to you to interpret how you, how you feel about it. Which brings us back to say, is AI art original? Is it art at all? If we take the product of a machine, can we present it as our own? And the answer, I think, is obvious. Of course you can. This is a question that was settled over a hundred years ago when Duchamp put a urinal into an exhibition. To bring back Bart, 
a photograph says, look at this. And we can look at art and say, look at this. We point at a thing and we say, this is art. But the real question might be, why do we care about a machine's art? Ultimately, the question around art isn't just, does this look cool or who made it first? I want to encourage you to engage with art around a different question or set of questions, which are, is the thing you're engaging with saying something interesting? Is it expressing something that you've felt, experienced, or a way of seeing the world that comes from within you and attempts to reach other people? Does it connect to the viewer in a way that makes them say, tell me more, tell me more about this? Do they want to spend time in the world created by your images? And this is true of AI art, it's true of game design, it's true of making characters and writing short stories. Do people connect with those characters? Do people lose themselves in your images? Do they engage with your music or your soundtrack? Are you making work that says something about a context, a community, your values, your thoughts? Or are you taking work from other people that doesn't really mean anything to you? The question, is AI art theft or is AI art original, is really hard to answer. It's like asking back in 1955 if electronic music was copying music or capable of making original music. I think it comes down to specific images and individual practices. It's an unsatisfying answer, but if you ask me if AI art is theft or a new art form, the answer is, it depends. I think AI art is in a unique position to raise all kinds of interesting questions. Just as the appropriation artists swam in a sea of images, AI artists are swimming in today's modern world. A sea of data, surveillance, automation, user-generated content, memes, misinformation, deep fakes, all of which communicate to us through the language of images and screens. There are so many important questions that we can raise through the use of AI as a medium. So I wanna show one more art project today from Agnieszka Courant, who made a series called Assembly Line. For Assembly Line, Courant made use of the same online clickwork sites used to curate training data for artificial intelligence systems. But instead of paying these workers to edit a collection of images, she asked these workers to take self-portraits. Courant then used an algorithm to generate a kind of composite of these images and use the resulting pixel information to print a 3D sculpture. We've talked a lot about the appropriation of artists by artists today, and while there is some conceptual territory to cover there, it can also be interesting to think about how we might appropriate the technology or the systems of this technology. Courant used Mechanical Turk not to curate a training set in a way that erases the workers who make it, as many image training sets do. Instead, the work highlights the human labor that goes into building these data sets by building a data set of and with those workers. In the end, the transformation into a industrial object comments on the assembly line from the industrial era, a suggestion that the people who make things are literally a part of the things they make. This work is a reflection and a comment on systems of power because it uses Amazon Turk in ways the platform was never intended. Along the way, it uses the systems of AI art and image making to raise critical questions about the systems of AI art and image making. Taking photos of photos, making images of images, they were important because they introduced questions about power and the meaning of those images. Today, we live in a world of data, more so than a world of images. And the artists are asking similar questions about data and digital infrastructure and invisible labor and algorithms. Rather than taking pictures of pictures, they make algorithms about algorithms. They collect data about data and they generate images about generating images. These are not the only strategies, but they, alongside appropriation, speak to different ways of using the products of our culture, the products of our technologies, and asking what can they do rather than what do they say. I said I was going to show you uh, just one example, but actually I'm, I lied. I'm going to show you one more. 
This is an example from James Bridle, whose work Autonomous Trap 001 was a clever comment on the limits of automated driving, uh, specifically addressing the AI image recognition system that is used to navigate the road. What you see is Bridle painting a circle on pavement with some salt. And he created a situation where there's a solid line on the center and a dotted line on the outside. And if you've driven a car before, it might have been a while since you took your driving test, but you know that that dotted line means you can pass. So you can pass, if that dotted line is on the left, you can pass on the left lane. So here, the car sees this as it can pass, but then it is surrounded by a solid line as soon as it does pass. And the solid line says you cannot pass. So in the end, the car enters into the circle, but it can't leave. It's forbidden by the solid line. This piece is funny, it's thoughtful, and it makes you think about the limits of AI vision. And this was created at a time where self-driving cars were supposedly right around the corner. It tells us a little about the machine learning systems and how they see the world. And it's doing it by playing with the systems themselves. It's looking at how the systems work, and it's saying, what can I do with that? Not just what is this system, what is the system saying, but what is the system doing, and what can I do with the system? But even if you aren't interested in those questions, there's a lot we can do with these images. E following the same mold of Warhol or Sherry Levine or Rauschenberg, basically we can see these images not as finished products that come out of the computer, but as material for us to work with. We can reconceptualize them, re recontextualize them. We can reimagine them. We can make something new. Right now, the technologies of these images is new and bold, and it inspires a lot of awe and wonder. So did the camera when it was launched. And there was some controversy over whether photographers are making art at all. Eventually, the mystery of photographic images faded, and we saw people working to create a new visual vocabulary with their cameras. Cinema did the same thing. People didn't think to cut from one frame to another to tell a story. They had to figure this out through experimentation. People didn't know how to make movies when movies were invented. So this is an exciting time to be making work with these tools and to be watching people making work with these tools because we haven't figured it out yet. And there's some interesting work out there that is built around using AI for something new, the way people use synthesizers to make these weird new forms of music. A lot of the art you're gonna see and a lot of the art that you're gonna make is gonna be weird. It's not gonna have references to other things because it's new. And that should be seen as exciting, not disappointing. Even if the work isn't particularly compelling, it's really fascinating to watch these new medias unfold and see what people make and how people are grappling with the technology. And maybe these will lead to new popular art forms. So this class is really meant to encourage you to be experimenters. I'm asking you to define your own relationship to the work you make and to think about what your intentions are. What do you want to say with the images that you take from the AI's output? How are you going to define whether it's yours or the machines or the artists in the data set that the machines are taking this work from. I also want to suggest that in the end, the question is to take the technologies of these machines and ask, what can you do with them? And on that note, next week, we are going to start our first big project in training GANs. And we're also going to hear from an artist who is asking a lot of questions through artwork around ethics and the use of technology. So I look forward to that and hope you do too. See you then. Bye-bye.